omega-3 fatty acids are the most important fat for the brain. True. So far, to the best of our knowledge today, they are. And um, this comes from multiple different studies, um, studies that look at consumption of omega-3 fatty acids as food and also omega-3 fatty acids as supplementation. Dean and I published a couple of papers a couple of years ago mm -hmm. looking at multiple different papers that have come out that look at omega-3 supplementation in, um, in two populations. Um, the majority of the studies were done in children and in elderly populations to see whether supplementation improved cognition, cognitive you know, outcomes. Um, and they had different kind of neuropsychological testing endpoints yeah. end for children versus the elderly. The data wasn't very clear. We don't have very clear outcomes, but there was a trend. There was a trend towards improved cognitive outcomes, both in children and elderly, when they had enough omega-3 fatty acids in their dietary patterns and when they supplemented if they needed it. And when you look at the pathophysiology of, say, let's talk about the elderly population. Um, as it happens, omega-3 fatty acids are necessary for maintaining the infrastructure of the neuron and the neuronal connections. As a matter of fact, 57% of our brain is made up of DHA. And it needs to be replaced on a regular basis. Our reservoir goes down significantly when we don't get enough of it. People always think that we need to eat fat. You know, brain is made out of fat. We need to eat fat. And cholesterol. Yeah, and, and cholesterol. cholesterol. Yeah, it is made up of fat. You know, when you look at the dry weight of the brain, it's about 50% fat. Um, but the kind of fat matters. We don't need saturated fats. As a matter of fact, our brain doesn't have the capacity to internalize saturated fats or cholesterol. We do make enough cholesterol in the brain, in the neurons that would serve its purpose. But the one kind of fat that we need on a regular basis is the long chain fatty acids, omega-3. And is there a, a kind of amount that you would recommend for people of different ages or, or what, what, I know that you supplement in your, your life. How do you approach yeah. that? Again, the data is not clean. Um, the data is flawed by two factors. We only saw signal later in life and in early life. And it doesn't mean that in midlife it's not beneficial. It's just that in midlife, the, the, our ability to detect delta, our ability to detect change <clears throat> as, as far as cognition is concerned is not good because there's an incredible amount of cognitive reserve, which means that our cognitive capacity is good enough that even if there, when there's vacillation, it's so minimal to not be able to be detected by the tools we have. That's a little complicated, but midlife, we probably are affected significantly by omega-3, but we don't have the tools to detect the change that well. I want to put a, a pin on this comment because I think this is one of the concepts that is not really discussed in all of the different conversations about brain health and health in general. Just because we don't see a signal during midlife about something or when if people feel fine doesn't necessarily mean that we don't lay the foundation of disease during that that period. Sorry, I just wanted to come. Oh, it's beautiful. Really highlight that. Well, that's that similar point. to so cardiovascular disease. Correct, but even more so for heart, uh, for the brain. Uh, the brain infrastructure, 87 billion neurons, billions and trillions of connections. This is the infrastructure that you're creating after the age of 21. Before that, it's the it's the cells, growth of cells. In fact, there are some programs cell death around age five or so, so that uh, you have you end up with less cells. But the connections are built thereafter. And much of the connections are related to your environment, how much you're challenged, a bunch of stuff. But also the myelination continues all the way to early 20s. So now you have the what they call brain capacity. But cognitive capacity, these are arbitrary terms that are created to describe certain things. Cognitive capacity is the connectivity of the neurons, the infrastructure. Imagine a building, a huge building, that's held up by billions of pillars. And so if a few of them are knocked down, nobody sees any difference from outside. Which means cognition hasn't necessarily changed in a way that would be yeah. observable. Observable. The building is functioning. Nobody sees any difference, but the pillars are being knocked down one at a time in, in your 20s. I want this to be emphasized because it's very difficult for us to emphasize brain health to younger people 
we're writing a third book and, and a huge segment of it, actually more than a third, is around children and, and young adults and their brain capacity. And those pillars are foundational. We're knocking them down or building them in our 20s. So everything you eat, every, your exercise, everything determines those pillars. So the, the pillars of knock down, knock down, knock, knock down. And then in your 60s, now there are enough pillars knocked down where you start seeing the wavering. So I think in that example, you, were, you, you mentioned a building, so a pillars yes. in, in a building, right? And so if that building falling down is sort of synonymous with cognition um, impairment, right? Correct. Being observable. Now, you can take a peek into that building. You could do an inspection and notice, okay, some of these pillars are, have been knocked down. Yes. We, we might want to get on the front foot here before this thing falls down. Yes. And <clears throat> maybe that's something we'll come back to because I, I know a lot of people will be interested in, okay, I'm, I'm 30, I'm 40. What can I measure? What are my, are there biomarkers or tests or scans that I can do in my brain that will tell me, hey, you're on the, you're on the road to Parkinson's or you're on the road to Alzheimer's dementia or Huntington's, whatever it may be. I think it's the most critical topic that we should be speaking about because it's in our, in our thirties that it's not just that we're avoiding disease, but we're actually building capacity. Yes. That's been our focus in the last few years. Uh, it's not just Alzheimer's, but younger people. The, how do you t get the signals to the young people to show that, oh, look, you're losing some capacity here or you're gaining capacity? That's, that's something because if you don't have those markers, people are not motivated. Motivation is, 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 a, is a complex thing when, you, when your life is driven by other factors when you're younger. But it's, that's when it starts, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to your brain. Um, and, and, and it's foundational. So now when we looked at the data with omega-3, one of the factors, just one of many, um, we, we didn't see any, most of the papers came back negative because the population they had included were younger people. The, we didn't have the tools of detecting signal, but we know that it affects them as much, if not more. What we did see signal, and I'm going to get to the dosage, was later in life, or even pre-dementia patients called MCI or mild cognitive impairment patients, which have a much higher proclivity for dementia. And these populations, you did see an effect. Omega-3 did have an effect, DHA, and it was at higher doses. And the second flaw with a lot of studies were they, they never saw signal because the doses were lower. Dosage problem, and we were gonna talk about uh, uh, other uh, studies that with choline and other things where the dosage comes to us from many years ago accidentally, but nobody focused at dose studies. They were looking at effect studies. So in that population, the higher doses were the, the, the dose that saw signal, 1,000 milligrams, 1,500 milligrams. So um, it's, it's not definitely not definitive as far as the dose, but we went on the higher dose as far as omega-3 is concerned. One of the other things I've thought about those trials, but it goes across nutrition trials in general, is the importance of knowing someone's baseline levels of DHA or APA that in the study, um, because you could give everyone one gram of DHA EPA, but the levels achieved at an individual level through that study are going to be vastly different. And so another approach would be to somehow personalize the dose for each participant to achieve a given DHA or omega-3 index, and then to say, okay, well, if you get to X percent, uh, like five, six percent omega-3 index, whatever dose that is for you, personalized dose, then you're going to have lower risk. It would be another way of looking at it. Absolutely. I think we're learning more and more that not everybody achieves a particular level if they're given a particular dose. Um, from the studies done in uh, the APOE4 um, allele population. So say, for example, if ha someone has one copy of apolipoprotein uh, 4, which is has been associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's disease, they've seen that when they have APOE4, they don't necessarily transport DHA as much as non-APOE4 allelic uh, participants do. So that nuance and that personalization depends on so many different factors. Are we there yet? No, we're not. We don't know. We don't have enough data 
to be able to prescribe and personalize a specific nutritional pattern or whatever whatever needs that a person um, has for preventing Alzheimer's disease. And to tie this concept to the question that you asked before, like what do people, what do, what should people do? Like you're a younger person and now you know a lot about brain health. Where do you start from? What kind of biomarkers are there? So the answer to that question is it has multiple tiers, right? So generally speaking, just the awareness that you have to take care of your lifestyle, what you eat, how you move, how you sleep, how you keep your mind active is very important. And that should be spread out as far as, you know, in the form of a public health announcement is concerned. And then going deeper into more personalized um, and more detailed and more nuanced approaches to personalized uh, medicine for brain health is concerned, there, there are some flaws in there. You know, there are some companies and some physicians who are kind of taking this way too far and extrapolating way beyond the data and recommending things that are not really based well into science. But um, we have enough data as far as vascular risk markers are concerned. So for example, if you have blood pressure, high blood pressure, and that blood, high blood pressure is, believe it or not, anything over 120 millimeters of mercury for systolic and anything above 80 millimeters of mercury, the diastolic. If your blood pressure is one, over 120, over 80, that's a problem. Which is a lot of people. Huge. A lot of people. I think the numbers are crazy. Even in, in the United States, I'll stick to our country, in the United States, People between the ages of 18 to 39, 24, 25% of them have high blood pressure. Just, just think about that. They need to be on a medication, right? So those are easily modifiable things. Not, I, I shouldn't say easily. You know, for some people, it might actually be related to some underlying disorder that may need some treatment or something of that nature. So knowing your blood pressure, knowing your LDL cholesterol, we've talked about this in the past, high LDL has been correlated with cognitive impairment and cognitive decline during midlife as well as later on in life. Making sure that people understand what their hemoglobin A1C is, which is a marker of glucose metabolism, what their fasting glucose monitor is. That doesn't mean everybody should be wearing a continuous glucose monitor, but you know, having an idea of what your glucose metabolism is, cholesterol is, blood pressure is, making sure that your vitamin B12 levels are checked, making sure that your vitamin D levels are checked. Those are some of the surface level, easily modifiable risk factors that are available now. And then when it comes to, say, for example, omega-3 fatty acid metabolism, knowing your APOE4 status, and even going deeper down into things like, how does my body metabolize vitamin D? Do I have enough vitamin, active vitamin D available for my brain to use it, to think better, to function better? Those are a little more you know, nuanced things that are available. But I always fear of you know, some of these companies taking advantage of people and selling them things that are not really based on science so far. Mm -hmm.